I have to add, there's also a time of war and a time of peace. That's an important part of Ecclesiastes 3. To everything, there's a season. There's a time when people get born. There's a time when people die. If you want to understand this scripture, you've got to hear it. It's not like you get to choose what time it is. This is saying there are big turnings in life. And there's times when it's mourning. And there's times when there's joy. How do you live with all the different times? You've heard the song. Peter played it. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. Because it's as if there's big turnings, big rotations, big orbits in life we have no control over. And the question is, how do we remain nimble? How do we adjust to all the big turnings? The way the Bible teaches is that if you live long enough, you can get a feel for the pattern. You can get a sense for, okay, I think this must be a time to celebrate. And so when it's a time of joy, your God-given task is to make whoopee, embrace it, enjoy it, because it won't last forever. But this is your time of joy. When it's your time to mourn, the Bible would suggest this is your time to slow down, don't buy anything, don't make any big decisions, take a deep breath, find those practices and breathing exercises that make the contractions bearable. In times of joy, go for it. In times of mourning, pull back. And the Bible suggests that if you live with your eyes open and your mouth shut, eventually you can get a feel for the times. I don't know if you've discovered that in your life. You know, the first time around, you have no clue what's happening. Is this a time to embrace or a time to refrain from embracing? Is this a time when I'm supposed to hold on tight I mean, how often do we tell people that? Don't quit. Don't give up. Remember Winston Churchill? Never, never, never give up. We have an idiom back in the South that says, hang on to that gospel plow and don't let go. There's a time when your job is whatever happens, don't let go. But there's also a time to let go. There's a time when we're all supposed to finally say, okay, there's nothing I can do about this. I have to let go. How do you know what time it is? Well, again, one thing is just live a little bit longer and start to get a feel. The great spirituality would be to have the same feel for life that an athlete has for the game. You know, the athlete that seems to know when to pass, when to, I guess I should say kick. I was going to say shoot. Everything's basketball with me. But you know, that person that always seems to know when to pull back, when to go forward. What if you could live that way? There is a time to dance. There is a time to mourn. And it helps to know this because that means when it's time to dance, when it's time to laugh, you still kind of keep some self-control because you know it could change. 
But when it's time to mourn, you recognize this too will pass. This text in Ecclesiastes is about living with these big seasons that we have no control over. I mean, I can't help. I see Jay here. I want to talk about sports. I mean, if you, if you, you know what it feels like when it's like the field is tilted. And it's just everything is happening for you. And I'm so happy you guys got to ride that wave this year. And I hope those kids realize it's not their, they don't get to just keep that. They don't get uh, everything goes your way for the rest of their life. That is a precious gift. You can be on a team where the field's tilted the other way and it's always uphill no matter what you do. But how do you live given the fact that you're not in control of the times? You're not in charge of these times. And the goal? The goal is, as Psalm 34 says, to bless the Lord at all times. Now, to bless the Lord at all times does not mean to listen to Christian music constantly. It doesn't mean to mumble a prayer all the time. To bless the Lord at all times means that in every season of life, you find a mission and dignity and purpose. In every season of life, there is something holy in it, even if it isn't pleasant. I was thinking about the seasons this week because I met in the church with a woman whose father had just died. She said to me, through her tears, I don't know where my father is. And she wasn't saying, is he in heaven? Is he in purgatory? Is he in um, some kind of place where you get reincarnated into a caterpillar? She was saying, for every day of my life, I had this source of love and support. If I needed 20 bucks, if I needed a hug, if I needed, there was this person there. And she's saying, where is that person? And you know, people like that don't grow on trees. And if you lose one of them, there isn't necessarily somebody else who replaces them. But the real truth is, she wasn't saying, I'll never see my father again. Well, I'll never know him again. Because there's an incredible thing that people do to each other. They plant seeds of love in each other's hearts. And there are many of you who have had loved ones die. And you are here today and you can say, like I can say about my grandmother, I still receive her love. Because as it turns out, she planted herself in my heart. She built over the years, board by board, room by room, a sanctuary. And now she's got an apartment inside me and she's available I get all the love from her it's still there I know she cares about me I know she thinks I can do things I can't do I know she forgives me when I do stupid things I know she's there and what this woman was saying was how long until my father I, I, I relocate him because he's not out there anymore. He's still there, but now she's got to find him inside. And talk about a season, a turning. Have you ever known that turning? You have to wait, you can't rush it. But the time it takes for someone you love, 
you miss them for them to all of a sudden for you to rediscover them inside you when you were used to them being on the outside. That's a turning. You have no control over it, but you can wait and you can have faith until it happens. We are not in control of these big turnings about when it's a time to mourn, when it's a time to dance. You're going to get to choose them. It just happens. But the question is, you have to roll with them, with these turnings. You can't speed them up. You just have to follow that incredible spiritual practice of waiting. Waiting. So those are the big turnings. However, there are little turnings you can make. You can't control the stock market. You can't control, you know, the Red Sox coming out of the All-Star break and they can't score a run. <laughs> but there are little turnings you can make. The Bible has this word, the Old Testament, shuv. And it means to rotate. And it gets translated as repent, but that sounds so tough and hard and onerous. The point is, you should repent. That means you've always got to be rotating. In your life, you can't sit still. You've got to constantly be adjusting because there are big turnings going on and you have to adjust. So the question is how to live with all the great turnings of life and then how to remain spiritually alive so that we are able to adjust to God's turning. When I think about great turnings, I think about the day that Annie Sullivan was trying for years to teach Helen Keller how to understand. And then one day, Ann Sullivan was working a pump on a, uh, working the handle on a water pump with Helen's hands underneath and she was spelling out the word for water and then one day it turned and Helen Keller understood. I think about turnings. I think about the day that Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama just refused to budge and something turned. Now, here's real sports trivia, and this tells you where I'm from. I'm from the world of where people like the Cincinnati Reds. You've never even heard of them. Everything's Red Sox up here. But there was a great turning one day in the 1940s when the Brooklyn Dodgers came to Crosley Field at Cincinnati. And Jackie Robinson went out on the field for the first time in Cincinnati. And God bless those people in Cincinnati. You think it's above the Mason-Dixon line? It is geographically, but it's not culturally. And Pee Wee Reese, this little Kentucky boy, went out and put his arm around Jackie Robinson. And when he did that, that crowd, who knew Pee Wee was one of them, had to stop. That was a turning. When the widow rediscovered herself with a single identity like she used to have decades before, that's a turning. When a community, a church, goes through a long period where they feel like they're puny and they're in decline, and then finally, though, they just feel like, what the heck? We're the people of God. Whether we've got 500 or 50, 
We are going to have joy. That's a turning. If you've ever been depressed and there's a period where you feel this exquisite sensitivity as if every time your grass gets walked on it remains depressed it doesn't bounce back up and when that finally lifts and all of a sudden the world you can it, it seems okay again that's a turning when the wound healed when the anger abated when the child slept through the night, when the side stitch gave way to a second wind. Those are turnings. Have you ever had a turning? Have you ever been turned? Here's the thing about these turnings. Direction is more important than speed. So as we adjust, as we rotate, as we repent, it doesn't matter whether you sprint or whether you walk slowly. The key is that you turn to where you think God is. That you turn in the right direction. Because if it's true that there are seasons and times then our lives must be a constant set of turnings and adjustments. In every new season, we've got to reacclimate. Haven't you all discovered that? Oh, isn't it terrible? You think, oh, finally, when the kids go to school. Oh, finally, when the kids get their driver's license and they can carry themselves around. Oh, finally, when the kids, oh, finally, when the kids. Where's that space? where you don't have to keep adjusting. Where you don't have to keep rotating and changing. You never reach it. And thank God you don't reach it. Because the day you stop turning, we won't go there. There's one, more, there's one more turning in the Bible. There are the big turnings that we have no control over. The seasons. There are the little turnings we can control. We should constantly be adjusting and growing and changing. But the Psalms talk as if there's one more kind of turning. As if there's times when God doesn't seem to be turned toward us. I know we're not supposed to say that, but it can feel sometimes like, where's God? Why isn't God looking at me? Why doesn't God notice me? You know, the uh, famous benediction, the prayer from Numbers chapter 6, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make you his face to shine upon you the Lord lift up his countenance it's a prayer it says may God lift up his countenance and notice you but do you know the feeling when it seems as if God doesn't notice you so this is a prayer too God Turn toward us. Don't be looking somewhere else. Jesus once told a parable about a judge. And the widow went to the judge and kept bothering the judge and bothering the judge. And finally, the judge heard her case. And Jesus says that's what prayer is like. You're supposed to be persistent. Sometimes it takes more than once to get God's attention. What is the end of all of these turnings? Our only hope, our great hope, 
is that our turnings and God's turnings coincide. This is what the Old Testament refers to as shalom, and it means harmony. We turn to God, God turns toward us. Jesus finally didn't describe it with a word like shalom. Jesus just told a story about a young man who had lost his way, but he turned around and came home. And when he did, the father turned toward him. So dear God, when we come to ourselves and turn toward you, toward home, we pray that like that father in Jesus' story, you will come running toward us. In Jesus' name, amen.